So we're starting a few minutes late. I apologize. We will start our meeting now. I'm so thrilled that so many of you are here for recognitions. So we'll get our meeting started. We'll do the recognitions first. And then you're more than welcome to stay for the whole meeting. But we don't expect you to do that because they can be long and sometimes tedious. So um, are you ready? OK. So HCAM is ready. I will. Um, so the school committee, actually, we opened our meeting earlier. We had need of executive session. Um, and so we have completed our executive session and adjourned with the purpose of returning to the regular meeting. So I will ask that you all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to quickly read through the agenda, and we will get right to work. So we have a number of recognitions um, for students tonight, followed by our first opportunity for public comment. Next, we have reports to the school committee. We have a report from our student council, an F-1 visa program update from Mr. Hanna, an ESBC report, um, an acting superintendent's report, the school committee chair report, liaison reports, and we will have a strategic plan update by Dr. McLeod, which we actually will move um, to the beginning of the reports. Under new business, we will take up the matter of a request for a historical commission plaque on the property of the new elementary school. We'll review the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship. We will um, consider appointing our representative to the ACCEPT Board of Directors, have a discussion and decision on lunch prices, and then under old business, we will take up uh, an, an amendment to our contract with Gale Associates and um, revisit the Athletic Field Subcommittee membership. Following all of that, we will have our second opportunity for public comment, items by consensus, and we are hoping to adjourn by 9.40. So um, without further ado, I would like to start off with our recognitions. And if it would be okay with you, um, Chair Birchman, I would like to interrupt <laughs> <laughs> and uh, begin with a recognition that's not on the list. Oh. Um, so anybody who is here to help with the recognition that we have planned, if you could just step forward so that Jean and John can see you. I know that the principals are here. Come on up, everybody. Oh, turnabout is fair play. <laughs> I know there's some family members here. You coming up? Yeah, come on over. Um, so we are, we are here tonight um, among many to, um, to recognize Jean Birchman and John Graziano um, for their service to the community as members of school committee. Um, I know that you have both served on other committees in addition to school committee and as I was thinking about tonight I thought you know that both of you really represent those individuals that do so much for so many and that just any way of expressing that people have no idea the countless hours and the sacrifices and the time. I know for one that I have made phone calls to you at all hours um, and on a personal note could not have felt more supported by both of you over my tenure as superintendent. Um, it, it's really important that your time here be recognized and we have a few people here who would, would like to be able to do just that. Um, but before I do that, I um, have something for each of you um, Jean, we'll begin with you if you could come up in recognition of your nine years of service. Um, maybe we'll stand right here in front of the camera um, to the Hopkinton School Committee from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Oh, thank you. So. John, in recognition of your six years of service to the Hopkinton School Committee from the Massachusetts Association of School Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Remarkable and 
it's certainly worth celebrating. I think for anyone who has spent any time on local boards or involved in local communities knows how much time goes in. And in fact, the public face of this job is, is at best a third of the time that you've spent to make sure that the decisions made here uh, are the right decisions. And in every case, um, I know you both put your heart and soul into this and, and did in every case what was best for the town. And it's worth knowing that the five people representing our Hockington, it is incredibly clear how essential education and how important education is to this community and to the residents here. Um, and as a result of that community support, Hockington is one of the top school districts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is worth noting that also means that it's one of the top school districts in the country because Massachusetts is the top, and even further, one of the top school districts in the world because of our stature here in Massachusetts on education. So you are the tops of the tops. <laughs> no pressure. <for> and, <laughs> and for the town, you know, that, that's something that doesn't happen by accident. And it's a lot of dedication and community support that goes into that. But most importantly, it's also leadership that goes into that. And you are part of that leadership and are contributing today. And in fact, the students, many of whom will be recognized here tonight for the incredible achievements that they have, um, will go off into this world um, as a result of this system and make even greater changes. So you are literally kind of starting the ripples out into the greater world for the greater good, and that's really what we're celebrating here today, along with wishing you the very best in the next chapter of your public service. I'm sure that will continue. Uh, and I have citations here on behalf of the uh, Massachusetts House of Representatives, and I will read um, just one. It real, reads the community of Massachusetts, or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the House of Representatives. Be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincere congratulations to Jean Burton and John Graziano in recognition of your outstanding service to um, the town of Hopkinton and the Hopkinton School Committee and your tireless dedication to the success of Hopkinton students. And it's signed by the Speaker of the House, Bob DeLeo, and myself uh, as representative for Hopkinton. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. something from Kathy and from me. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so very much to all of you. And you'll love them. <laughs> <laughs> you'll wear them with pride. Yeah. And, and just look around. I know that um, it was especially important to all of the principals when I reached out to them to say, I know it's another night and I know it's the middle of May. Um, without hesitation, every, all five just, of course, will be there. You're, as a sign of, of the support that you have given them for six and nine years, um, in terms of, of their work, their hard work here. Um, it, it does not go unnoticed, and their, their being here tonight is, is their way of showing that to you. I don't know if anyone else had any had a brief comment. I think, Mr. Kerr, you wanted to say something. I always want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just so shy about these things. So uh, I just want to come and say thank you on behalf of the town as one member of the Board of Selectmen. You guys have done a fantastic job over the years. If you want an organization to grow, you lead people. If you want an organization to flourish, you lead leaders. And you guys have created a leadership culture in the hockey public schools, like I think none other in Massachusetts, and to Kathy's point, uh, to uh, Representative Dykeman's point, around the country. So we've got a great team of leaders behind you. You created this, and when really good leaders leave, everything carries on. So the, the, the culture you have created and the success you have created will carry on for years to come because of your leadership, uh, but you can step away knowing full well that the, 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 the district is in great hands. And the new members will come on and learn from the people that you've taught and so on, and it will just carry on for years to come. So uh, I'm just really uh, thrilled to have worked with you guys. I know how hard you work. Team texted me nonstop <laughs> today, 366 days a year. And I say that intentionally. Um, she creates days in which to work. <laughs> but it's paid off. And we can see it in what happened at the town meeting this year. And we can see it in the numbers. And we can see it in the hires that we have, like these two young ladies sitting at the table here. I think it's just a great organization. And I'm so excited for you guys to step out. And uh, I look forward to doing that someday soon, too. So thank you up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have
something from the three of us. Yes. Um, something small for each of you to enjoy while you're watching our meetings on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you choose to come here. And then something a little bit more from the three of us because in appreciation for all that you both have done for this committee, for us individually, and for the, the schools and the community at large, you both really embody the best of Hopkinton in the countless hours you have spent volunteering for many committees in addition to this. I know back before I was on the school committee, I worked with both of you as chairs when I was working for the paper, and so approachable, so easy to work with. It drew me to want to be on the committee. Um, so this, I passed to you. Oh, so oh. Great, John. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, you, in all the emotions and all the thoughts that everyone said, I know I'm here because of Jean Birchman. She is the one who inspired me, tapped on me. I've learned so much from you, Jean. And also, John, all the numbers, every single time you had that in there. And even today, you had that little tip as you're heading out, and that's in here. So your legacy will continue through us and for all the years that you have given and brought the schools to where they are, of course, with support from so many others, it means a lot, a lot to us as parents and also community members. Thank you. I'm a little worried to speak because I think we're losing 15 years of combined experience here, so I'm, you know, silently freaking out. Over here. <laughs> I feel like, you know, you two have been just a wealth of information for my first year and so hopefully we can keep all the good things that you've had moving in the right direction for the last several years. We'll keep them going for you. You guys have been amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And, and I also wanted to share on behalf of Rebecca Rebecca, who could not be here, that she wanted to send along her heartfelt thanks and appreciation for having been through the committee during some very difficult times uh, and to your attention to detail and to, to keeping the eye on things in the state level. Well, great appreciation through many chairs back who sat here before we did the table. So, okay. I wanted to also just take a moment um, to acknowledge Jean and John um, with their work behind the scenes uh, personally for me in my first two years. Obviously, so much of what you both do is so public, and someone said that what you do, um, you know, being here is maybe just a third of your work. Um, and though our meeting minutes from the Turf Fields Committee and, and everything is posted online, unless you're going and really physically looking for it, the work that the two of you have done um, is honestly immeasurable and the impact on this community from um, specifically from my role in the athletic department but the reach you have beyond that um, and the respect and high regard in which both of um, you are held the respect that the community has for you it's really a unique entity we have in, in our school committee here and you hear about other towns and the way that it exists and I think we're just so fortunate here you're both pioneers in so many different ways with what you do and um, Personally, from the bottom of my heart, I can't thank you enough for the support that you have given um, to me, but also to this town and community and being advocates for all activities. While I speak on behalf of athletics, I think that everyone in all their different um, roles could say the exact same thing, and you both have a way of making people feel important and special, um, and that trickles down to our students. So just thank you for your leadership, for your passion, and the legacy that you're both leaving here in Hopkinton. It's, it's something that will be lasting. So really appreciate that. All right, quick photo op. Right here, if you can stand in front of your, I know. your family. <laughs> <laughs> Shorter when we start. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not mine. Okay. Yeah. You got me. Yep. <laughs> I thought if they sat here through recognition. I didn't want to be too sad. Carolyn has something. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say that I'm really proud of you. Thank 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 you
to uh, ask for a point of a personal privilege, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. So um, here talking about leadership and education and the wonderful leadership of this board, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge uh, Superintendent McLeod here tonight um, publicly for all that you have done for this community. And I know that you had a reception earlier downstairs where people were able to celebrate you and and your contributions to this community, but I just wanted to come and publicly uh, recognize you. Um, I've seen you come into this community, um, introduce yourself in such an incredibly engaging way, incredibly responsive way that really um, looked to the community to provide guidance and, and you really built such a sense of trust and confidence uh, and cohesion in the school and the district team here uh, and really lived and breathed um, leadership by example, truly. And I have watched you in action and certainly I found myself saying, that is a, she is good, <laughs> she is good. Um, so for all of the legacy that you leave behind, um, opportunity to celebrate that here tonight. I have a citation for you as well on behalf of the Massachusetts House, but most importantly, I just wanted to say, um, we wish you the very, very best as you spend more time with your family, um, your grandchildren, your children. Uh, so many wonderful things to celebrate, and, uh, and a huge thank you from so many people. So, this is, come on up. means a lot. Thank you so much. It's lovely. Are we good to go? Yes. Um, Thank you. I, uh, I always say I never use five words when I can choose 50, but I can, I'm a little overwhelmed um, and very humbled. Thank you very much for all your kind words. And um, I have to say I'm so proud of the work that's been done around this table um, for the last nine years while I've been here and before me, and I, that I know will continue long after me. I'm just looking out at the people assembled in this room. I see some people that I've worked with across the community, across the district, parents, kids, that um, I've just learned so much uh, from all of you about how to work with other people and more about myself and, and all of that. And I just, um, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. I read a quote that said something about, don't be sad that it's over, be glad that it happened. Um, and I, I'm, I think both things are true, but <laughs> um, but that's sort of how it feels today. And I, I do just want to say to my family, if they're watching, how much I appreciate their flexibility in allowing me to be here and do things that I felt were important. Um, and as my husband cautioned me, I often spent more time doing things for my kids than with my kids, and I appreciate their forbearance. And um, and I'm just grateful, again, for the opportunity. So thank you all very, very much. That was very kind, and I appreciate it. And, and I would echo the thanks. It's um, very overwhelming for, for everyone to, to be here. Um, you know, as I've been looking back on on what has been accomplished over the the six years that I've been a part of this committee, it has been a tremendous amount of great work, um, and I, I feel just honored to be a part of it. Uh, the most frequent thing that people say to me when they have heard that I'm on the school committee is, um, "How do you have time for that?" And generally, the answer is, "I, I don't." Um, but every single minute I have spent working on this committee and with this incredible group of people has been worth it. Um, and I wouldn't trade one minute of it. So um, thank you again all for your kind words. Um, and I will I will definitely miss this, but um, it definitely won't be the end of, of my career in service to Hopkinton. I'll probably just take a little bit of time off. We are way behind on the We are way now. behind, and we have some very, very patient <laughs> students who took time out of their night and their families too to come and be recognized. So, um, without further ado, I, let's we'll go in the order that they are on the agenda. So, I'd like to invite Owen Fitzpatrick to come up, and um, yes, that would be great if you can come and sit over here. That way, H Cam can hear. Um, so Owen, this is the second time Owen has been here to be recognized for his work in writing competitions across the state. Um, and we have some prizes for you that you have won. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kavanaugh, who has a little synopsis of your, um, of your really remarkable essay that we all had the opportunity to read. And we'll let her take it from here. 
So, Owen, oh, I do have from the State House um, your certificate of top honor um, the, from the Massachusetts Letters About Literature. And this year you wrote about the picture of Dorian Gray. Specifically, what Owen did was write a letter to Oscar Wilde. And I have excerpted just a paragraph from his work, and then we'll let Owen talk a little bit about it. Um, but in the early parts of his essay, he writes, when I read your book, what jumped out at me was that Dorian wanted to be popular. Most times, the best looking people are also the popular ones. Dorian's portrait is a reflection of the ugly-hearted, warped person he actually was, not the Adonis you introduce us to in the beginning. On Instagram and Facebook, people are hiding real life behind fake smiles and a touched-up photo with a flattering filter after more than 15 attempts to get the smile and lighting just so. So I thought it was very interesting that what he's done is he's taken a classic work of literature over 100 years old, and he has made that relevant within the context of social media. So Owen, you can tell us a little bit about your work and a little bit about your writing process. Well, my writing process is sort of like, hey, here's a thing. How about you just put as many words you can and just think about it and just put as much detail and feeling that you can into it. In that paragraph I wrote, I put my personal experience of what other people had experienced on social media. Because I, as you could read in there, I'm, I'm not really a social media type of guy. I don't have any apps. I don't have anything. I just, I'm, I'm just a kid who has a phone who talks to people. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, new experience that you learn from other kids how like you get to understand how their social media really works and on Instagram and Facebook on a big social media it's just always uh, like people like it says right there the touch up photo with the flattery filter and stuff there's tons of people on there with that and you just don't know really know what's going on behind there So I was saying to Owen earlier tonight that I had been a high school English teacher for a very long time, and you are a very gifted writer. Thanks, um, obviously, two years' worth of successive awards, right? We'll speak to that. Um, and I will bring you what they have said to us from the State House for you. Yeah. Do I, um, do and I, you may also want to just talk briefly about some of your other writing, um, your blog, and, and other things that you have going on right now. Okay, speaking of blog, um, after... I wrote um, for a contest in the library of, for the Library of Congress. I wrote a letter to Charles Dickens about a Christmas Carol and how it related to me. And I won that contest, and that got the attention of the Hanover Theater. And they said, "Hey, how about you write a blog, write some blogs about some of our uh, Broadway plays that are happening?" I'm like, "Sure." I, and then I've seen something rotten. I've seen Jersey Boys, uh, Rent, I've seen Bright Star, and we're going to see The King and I this Sunday. Um, it, I've written a bunch of blogs about that, and I, I've also recently won an Eversource contest about the Eversource Energy Company. I'm sure you all heard about that. And I actually got second place there and won $250, which is really, really incredible. <laughs> I never really thought I could actually get that. <laughs> and more recently from that, I've won again in the um, Library of Congress. Right, instead of writing to jo Charles Dickens, I wrote to um, Oscar Wilde. So, so, and it turns out I am the only kid from Hopkins, or like Ann Hopkinson and Massachusetts, You've won that contest twice in a span of 25 years. Well, wow. I've I never thought it would ever come to that, but I, I guess fate has a way to go. <laughs> I think it does Thank have you. a way to go. Yeah, very impressive. That's outstanding. Thank do, you. Do I go on? Thank you so much. I have no doubt you're going to be back here next year. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Do we have Mrs. Bellello here to bring up her? To, do you want everybody to come together? What would you like to do? Why don't I do one? Okay. 
I'm going to turn this right over to you. Do you mind if we just play the clip? Sure. Go ahead. Would you like me to explain something first, or do you sure. want to play it Absolutely. first? Absolutely. That would be good. So I'm sitting here with one of our fifth graders from Hopkins School. This is Dil Zafar Singh. He is a fifth grader. He joined the Hopkinton Schools last year as a fourth grader when his family moved from Cambridge out to Hopkinton for the good schools, right? Especially <laughs> <laughs> Hopkins, that's right, right? <laughs> and... Um, Dilzuffer was interviewed along with his father for a show on CNN called United Shades of America. And I thought it was really relevant for us to bring Dilzuffer here tonight because I think one of the most unique things that's happening in Hopkinton is this growing diversity that we're getting in our community. And I know as a school at Hopkins, we've really been talking about embracing different kinds of diversity and talking with our students about being comfortable about sharing who they are. Our theme this year is only one you. And we really want to embrace the cultural diver diversity that we have, the religious diversity, the learning differences we have. And um, Dilzafar spoke really honestly and from the heart about some of his experiences here that we wanted to share with the community as, at large because we think it's important work that Hopkinton has to do in the next couple of years thinking about all of the changes that have occurred in this community. Or do you go to school with lots of different kids of different religions? There's only one other six. Oh, really? Okay. So, do kids ever make fun of you because of your religion or because of you cover your hair or anything like that? Yeah, um, I had some issues like that last year because I moved to a new school. A kid would make fun of me for having long hair. So, when the kids were bothering you, you never thought. I should not, I should go home and take this off, get a haircut, and try to blend in. I actually think that I'm lucky to be a sick. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to have that. Nice, nice. That's well said. That's definitely going to be on TV, just so you know. That's definitely going to be on TV. <laughs> He's definitely going to be on TV. He just made the cut. <laughs> So thank you for having those offer here. We're really pleased that the committee recognized some of the work that Hopkins is certainly undertaking. We've talked about that in our school improvement plan. And um, those offer, you know, really from such a young age to be willing to speak out and talk about some hard conversations that adults are not always comfortable speaking out about is really wonderful to see and I think is a testament not only to his family, his upbringing, but also the great education that he gets <laughs> in the Hopkins <laughs> Public Schools, right? Excellent, thanks. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. So now I'd like to bring up another Hopkins student. It's a really exciting night for us. We really believe at Hopkins School teaching students about following their passions. And Logan is another student that, this is your second year in Hopkinton Schools too as well. Um, Logan and his twin sister Abigail are fifth graders at Hopkins School. And this year he, actually did it start last year? in your conversations. So last year in health class, we talk about having really a wonderful, well-rounded education. We have a fabulous wellness teacher at Hopkins School. She's also at Center, Kathy Lewinsky. And she really inspired Logan talking about the dangers of tobacco and nicotine. And that launched Logan on his own to reach out and write some letters on behalf of the Tobacco 21 initiatives that were going on around the state. He was definitely concerned that Hopkinton hadn't jumped on the bandwagon per se and joined other towns that were passing the Tobacco 21 initiatives. So Logan reached out to the selectmen 
and actually came and spoke to the Board of Selectmen, who then invited him to speak to the Board of Health. And um, at a recent meeting, as you all know, it has passed that Hopkinton now no longer will be having tobacco sold for students under 21, children under 21. And I think that kind of passion that's come from a classroom experience, learning about dangers to youth, and then using that and launching that into writing and speaking publicly, to me, um, is the greatest thing we can do for our students, that we give them a passion and they hear their voice. And Logan certainly found his voice in this process to the point where NBC came out and interviewed him at our school. And you actually did another interview too, right? Um, to talk to him about it. And then right after that, the state has really launched passing this across Massachusetts. And I'd like to think that Logan has done his part to really make some big differences towards the tobacco. Thank you. Thank you, both, both of you boys, so much for being here and for, you know, just, we have so much to be proud of in this district, and you really represent the best of that, both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Nice job. We have to start watching those NESDEC reports for fourth grade being a spike increase here if kids keep getting on TV. <laughs> they seem to all be moving here. Everyone's moving here in fourth grade. Um, okay, and then our, our last recognition, Ms. King, are you going to? bring up so um, not long ago Miss King brought to us a pilot program of to start a new unified track team and so I know they've had some meets and um, we're here to to hear about the program and celebrate the success because we're so proud all right Thanks for having us here tonight. Um, so with the school committee's approval, and thank you for that, um, we were able to very quickly get the unified track season underway. And we have some members of the team here with us, which is awesome. And they are actually coming pretty much off the bus from yes. a meet. So, um, so they're probably a little hungry, but they're here and excited to be honored. Um, and so we will have um, Coach Caitlin Burke say a couple words about the experience, because it's much more meaningful, I think, to hear from Coach yeah. and the kids, um, our student athletes. And they will give you a little bit of a synopsis. And then we have. Uh, a video to show you from the first meet. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Wait, I'm going to go first name and then you can, okay? Um, hi. So, uh, so this is my first year coaching at Hopkinton. This is my second year as an intensive special needs teacher for the high school. And, um, you know, I'd, coming into it, I, I knew Unified would be such a great opportunity for the community to, you know, really branch um, inclusion out into the community as well as tolerance. Um, at, in the high school, we do a great job, I think, of uh, building that, that community, and sports is just a great way to infiltrate inclusion, and it, it's easy for them, and I feel like practices and games, it's, it just makes them more of a unit, and, and we're confident. Great job, Rai. And so I know that they want to speak more because anything I say, really, um, they've been my greatest teachers. Uh, you know, walking into practice and after a hard day, uh, you know, we just, I think there's just so many times where we just laugh and have such a good time. Um, and it's stress-free, you know. Um, it, but it also just brings that community. Um, you know, we just appreciate all the support from Hopkinton High School uh, and the school committee. Uh, we, th we felt really uh, loved and respected in that way. It's something new, uh, and we hope that more uh, people and more students come out for it uh, in, the, in the years to come. So, Liam, do you want to talk about what you do in track? Yeah. What do you do in track? Do it nice and light. So what, what do you play? Uh, the javelin. And what else? Um, the shot put, put and the, oh. You don't have to get so close. The microwave. That's the microphone. <laughs> um, the. You run the hundred meters. The hundred meters. Yes. And the. Did you javelin? The shot put. Good job. Yes. All right. Okay. So remember. Do I mind it? You have to lean a little bit that way. 
Okay, I want to thank my mom and dad to be, 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 be here tonight with me to support me as a great daughter to me. So uh, I've been doing, I'm doing really good, but all of a sudden Ella's in, and the girls are doing awesome. Uh, I love, I like to run. I do the 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 shot put. But usually I did got hurt in my arm, just to letting you know. And I, 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 I was recovered. And then I, I'm doing a javelin now, and I can I, I do, do that running. But I ran the first race, and I'm super t tired and exhausting. And my head is sweaty, and my, da my <laughs> yeah. dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you did. And my, I want to thank my dad to, to, to be here tonight. Thank you, Daddy. Uh, I just wanted to say that the value that I've gotten out of this experience personally is unlike anything that I've ever gotten out of an athletic, you know, experience before. And not only is it like a way to stay in shape and exercise and, you know, but it's also just an infectiously positive experience for everyone involved. And I think we can all say the same. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is my first year at the high school and I can definitely say that this is one of the most rewarding experiences for me and it's a lot of fun just going to practice three days a week and just seeing everyone and we're always smiling and it's just really fun to all be together and cheering each other on. All right, last but not least. I'm Ellis and I'm a sophomore and I want to talk about the support we get. Like this video will show Tons of people came. I was. I saw an email from Miss King the day before our first home meet about people showing up, and I expected a few people to come. And then we ran through the line, and there was a quarter of the track was filled, and it was great. And every day at school, I get asked about it, and great support, and it's just a great time. Awesome. So I think, um, as you can see, hearing from uh, these individuals who are members of the team and just uh, competed really well today, um, and our coach, Caitlin, who is just instrumental in um, the programs that she runs here at the high school, but also stepping in and taking on this fun new experience and took the bull by the horns. And um, Chip Collins is another one of our coaches who isn't here tonight, but has done the same and has uh, have so much fun and embraced the experience. So I um, want to thank all of them. And also um, to conclude, we'll just show this is a quick 30 second clip um, just to give those who were not able to be present at the first meet, but um, maybe heard about it or didn't uh, an opportunity to just see what happened. Um, and I can't say, I don't think there were many dry eyes in the house that, that day um, after that experience. So without further ado, here's our video and thanks for having us here tonight. I'd like to apologize for my voice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you're good. And I do wanna say thank you for all of you for, for coming here to be supporting the, uh, the mm -hmm. athletes and, and Having a, a, a good time here. Thank you. Good. Thank you. You guys look like an advertisement for the school store. You have so much to look at. Outstanding job, you guys. Thank you. What's your record so far? Um, Four and zero, undefeated. <laughs> Come on, here you go. I did feel that I was really happy at the end, but I got mad at once, so this is just so great, really good. Good, good. All right. Well, continue. Well done. Good luck. Thank you Thank so you. much. It's going to be really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Yes. All right. It's going to be really hard to uh, Do we have Josh first? compare after that. Thank you all so much for being here. We're just no. so proud of all of you. Outstanding work. Thank you. Outstanding work in a number of different ways. It's yeah. really it's exciting yeah. to see. It's incredible. All right, so we, are, we have arrived at the first opportunity for public comment. I don't know if there's anybody here from the public who would like to come up and make a comment. We're flooding out of the I know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> All right, so we'll move right along um, and actually... Um, all right, so we're going to shuffle the order a little bit for our reports to the school committee um, to accommodate people's schedules. So if I could have our ESBC um, chair and vice chair come up, we have invited them here to give us an update about progress um, on the building. It is looking super good. And um, wanted to make sure that we did this tonight because it's our last opportunity with Kathy and John to be here. So I will turn it over to Joe Markey and Mike Shepard to just give us an update about the building. Thanks uh, for having us. Uh, I think you're turned of off of there. All, I think they put the power uh, button. Continue to push on. Uh, first, uh, we want to thank uh, John and, and Jean for, and Kathy for all of their time that was put in with the school building project. Uh, their service on the school committee has been noted, but in addition to the time John didn't have for school committee, he also didn't have time for the uh, hundreds of meetings that we've had since uh, 2013 when the school building committee was formed. And John has been a, uh, a great partner on the school building committee. Uh, Jean also uh, has been very involved uh, from the school committee side. And of course, Kathy has also served directly as a member on the school building committee. So first, we want to thank you for your contributions and service on the school building committee. And you can see uh, the results are soon to be unveiled. Mike's going to give a little update on the construction, and I'll talk about the ribbon cutting. <clears throat> Which, do I have to hold down the blue button, or? No, the blue button should lock it. How's that? Does that sound good? No. Nope. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it down. All right. Um, essentially, yes. I want to thank Gene and John and, and communities such as ours that are relatively small function by volunteers. And I can't thank you for enough for the years and the time you've invested um, it, in the, on the school committee as well as other committees. I can't imagine that you won't be involved going forward as well. Uh, when I served on the Board of Selectmen, I was invited up here to give a, a speech to the seniors. And, and um, what I chose to write about was volunteerism and you know, to speak about. And <clears throat> my personal experience is that, that the, the jobs that are most rewarding are the ones you don't get paid for. And I think that's what you folks serve. And, and uh, we thank you. Um, I thank you personally. And uh, the town of Hopkins thanks you as well. Um, <clears throat> Kathy, just um, my two cents. Everybody's been saying all great stuff about you all day long. And it's, it's <clears throat> genuine. And I just want to say that you are the perfect fit at the perfect time. And um, our community has excelled. And um, it primary because of you, and we thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> now, the school. Um, it's only been six years. Uh, it's 95% done. Uh, they're paving. They paved yesterday. They, they paved uh, today, and they'll do it again tomorrow. Most of the landscaping is done. They are hydro seeding today. They've planted like 75 trees, and they're watering them as we speak. Uh, inside the school, all the finishes are done. Uh, there's, as most people will tell you, or some people will tell you, you you'll find there are 32 different colors in the school. Um, and the <clears throat> floors are incredible. The kids will be excited, and it'll be an energy efficient facility. It'll be cool in the summer. It'll be warm in the winter. And um, I think it's the perfect thing for our young learners, and also the staff that's been working at Center School for the last 25 years. Um, I think it'll be a rewarding experience for them. 
Uh, as I said, we're 95 percent done. We would like to turn the school over to you folks tonight. Um, we're about six weeks ahead of schedule already. Um, we anticipate significant completion, that is uh, at least a temporary certificate of occupancy before the opening day on uh, the 9th of June. Um, the furniture is being moved in. Um, it's just an exciting time, and I hope you all come to the opening, and, and uh, it, it's been a really neat experience. I want to thank the team, and, and again, it's all about the team, the building committee, uh, Lauren's help, um, and, and uh, it's been terrific. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, just a final piece of our update is about the upcoming uh, ribbon cutting ceremony on June 9th that will begin at 1 p.m. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, comments from uh, civic leaders involved in the project, as well as um, con on conclusion of that portion, we will uh, celebrate the new school with an open house where uh, the Hopkins community is invited to take a walk through through the new school and uh, see firsthand how we have uh, built a school that caters to the age group that it's built for and uh, also incorporates uh, the unique culture and history of Hopkinton. So we hope you can make it again Saturday, uh, June 9th from 1 until 3.30 p.m. at the new school, Marathon Elementary School. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you both very much for being here. We appreciate it, and we're so excited. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think that we are going to move up our strategic plan update from Dr. McLeod. So I'm going to be passing these down to my left, um, and we can hear all of what we've been up to for the last exactly. five years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for moving this out of order. I have a handout for you with the slides because um, given all of the other things on the agenda tonight, I did want to move rather quickly. Um, and so I thought you might like taking notes. <laughs> and uh, I know that you haven't had a chance to see this, which most often times you do. Um, but the approach that I took to um, tonight's presentation is to organize it in this way. Um, to think of our five theories of action, and really for the benefit of three out of five of the school committee members who were not here when we created the school committee strategic plan, um, it was organized around five areas or theories of action. So I'm going to briefly review what those were, and then within each area, look at the progress um, and what an exercise that was to see where we have come from since 2014 to 2017. Next, I took a look at the FY18 priority initiatives, so this year's priority initiatives, um, and so that you could see that this is what the focus was, or more of a reminder. And then finally, um, with Dr. Kavanaugh's help, looking at the 2018-19 objectives, um, which will be the focus for the upcoming year. In the final two categories, FY18 and 1819, each of these are aligned um, with the, the necessary budget. And so um, first, our first area of organization was under effective school leadership and the idea that in order to have ongoing um, sustainability within the dis district, then we really need to have exemplary educational leaders. And I'm not sure that I need to say anything more about that because it's been said over and over again tonight. Um, it's really, though, worth looking back to say, wow, back in 2014, this was, these were the things that we were working on. Um, the, the ideas behind hiring practices and, and compensation. And it's interesting for me, for us to look at goals for next year. Um, because these are, we're looking at them again. But that also makes sense to me that this was, this was several years ago. And it was one of the things that the school committee at that time really was concerned about, was holding on to the administrative team. Um, within that year, uh, under the first theory, was also, this, this was something it's so easy to forget, but we needed to finalize the strategic plan, which we had spent the first year, so 13, 14 of my tenure here developing. So very much part of that first year was finalizing it, 
um, determining what the priority initiatives were going to be and the timeline around each of those. And then we started to look at the school improvement plans. And here's an area where we can look back and think, boy, we've come a long way um, from school improvement plans that were really very individual and not tied to the overall school committee strategic plan. Um, these were very much areas of focus. This collaborative culture opening to di open to dialogue and trust. I note that the focus here back at the beginning was around admin council and creating a, a venue to develop this kind of culture, prioritizing initiatives, People were feeling really overwhelmed. They talked about spinning, you know, all these air, all these bowls spinning in the air. And the focus, or my work at that point, was to really try to prioritize and have people understand, you know, what their areas of focus should be. Um, in, and then this final one in defining roles and responsibilities was just encouraging people to constructively disagree and I was really pleased this afternoon to hear from one of the principals that they have no problem doing that at all. <laughs> so success on disagreement. So for FY18 again under this, um, under this area of effective school leadership this year um, again review and revising hiring practice I think this has more to do with um, attracting more diversity within the district, if I'm correct in, in saying that. Um, and then, again, this idea of clearly defining the goals that are aligned to the strategic plan. Um, and then, in addition to that, for this year, let's make sure that the, 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 the funding is there to support whatever those priorities are. So you will recall when we came to you for the school committee meetings, for the budget meetings, I mean, that the principals would present, this is how it's aligned to the strategic to the strategic plan, and moreover, um, sometimes was the result of some difficult conversations where there were things that community members would have loved for us to have taken on that we had not budgeted for and not prioritized. So the strategic plan was able to really help the school committee and the administrative team to focus their efforts um, because of those things. And finally, what was interesting for me to note under FY18 is the focus for collaborative culture has gone from the administrators to now teacher leaders and CTLs. And that's also a sign of progress, I think, within our strategic plan that, you know, th this has come from really being able to focus first at the administrative level and now this same initiative around this collaboration amongst teachers and CTLs. Um, the objectives for the upcoming year uh, is really around targeted professional development that are aligned with the priority initiatives. So uh, one of the things I thought about when I was going through all of this is the many changes that have happened just in the time that I've been here within um, the assistant superintendent role. And I think that that very much, that role is very much responsible for professional development. Um, I know that Ashok has been working over tirelessly on the technology plan, but then there wasn't always the time to provide those things and connect those things with the limited amount of time that we had for professional development. So I see that um, that Dr. Kavanaugh is, is really looking at making that a priority for next year. Um, so that those things that we call out as initiatives are going to be those things that we then align our professional development with. Um, this idea of professional learning community, not only looking at scheduling around that, but this idea of giving, having, encouraging time for staff to implement curriculum, write common assessments, develop instructional strategies. Um, Really, that's where the buy-in comes, right? Once we have the input from the teacher leaders. And I know that that's a real focus going forward um, to really develop that. And then finally, under effective school leadership, um, <coughs> using teacher leadership to promote curriculum implementation. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to curriculum. Well, that's where we are. But this idea of an aligned curriculum, and I, again, as I'm reflecting as I'm going through this, it really did come back to me um, several times that every time there's a, a new person in that position of assistant superintendent responsible for curriculum, th there is, there's going to be some, some carryover and some loss. Um, and I see that within the area in terms of 
um, not moving forward or repeating some of the goals is a better way of putting it, basically because of changes within that department. So we see this idea back in 2014-17 of a consistently implemented and vertically aligned pre-K-12 curriculum. We still see that today. Um, part of it is the changes, but the other part is the ongoing changes at DESE. You know, just trying to keep up with it um, and, and whatever the new um, initiative might be. So again, using teacher, really using teacher leaders and SMLs and CTLs to develop curriculum, that was a lofty goal back in 2014, 2015, 16. But at the same time, we really didn't have the funds for hiring nor the time to allow those people, those individuals willing to do the work to do the work. Um, so this is still something that is, is uh, a priority within the curriculum area um, for the upcoming year. And the initiatives for this year were monitoring the curriculum imp implementation. And again, you see these themes arising, providing opportunities for teachers to develop the curriculum. But these opportunities were real this year in FY18. These were times that Dr. Kavanaugh built into the schedule, made sure there was monies for teachers over the summer. Um, these were all things that, you know, were, were actually enacted in FY18. And then I see them again. Sorry, this was an FY18 articulating a pre-K-12 supplemental specialized curriculum. Here is one area that I would like to stress um, that continues to be an area that needs to be addressed. And I know that it's something that we've been working on all year, um, aligning the resources for a modified specialized curriculum, increasing opportunities for PLCs. Um, I know that one of the goals for this year was, was developing a specialized reading and writing instruction at the high school. So I call these out in this presentation um, because this is an area that I would suggest in order to keep in line with the uh, strategic plan, this is something that um, that you might want to continue to look at more closely um, in the upcoming, again, under curriculum. I know that there were certainly some budgetary discussions around additional supports. Um, you can see under the objectives for this coming year, uh, finalizing the vertically aligned curriculum, uh, I think there very close to mm -hmm. getting there. Oh, I think we're very close. Yep. Yeah. Um, here's this idea of the specialized curriculum coming in around the tier differentiated reading and writing programs. So this is where it's being called out under the 2018-19 objectives. And then enhance, you see it again here, enhance specialized curriculum and literacy in grades two, three, five. Um, this monitoring implementation across and between grade levels is ongoing work. And even though Dr. Kavanaugh and I did not have a chance to coordinate this presentation, you can see the consistencies between the plan, where we've come from, and where we're going. And I think that's because this has been a working document that we've used. We've used it. I know you heard you heard from the principals last year, uh, last week, last meeting, on around the school improvement plans, and I'm sure that these themes kept coming up, and you could see consistencies across buildings, um, and the same with with the way we're looking for our next steps next year. Under effective instruction, this idea of communicating high expectations in order to challenge students to grow, and again, I know I'm going quickly, but you have it in front of you. Um, the first place we needed to look at, and this came back to me again when I was reviewing all of this, is we had assessments all over the place in the district back then, um, but they were, not, they were not organized, nor were they analyzed. They were collected. We had lots of them, and we had assessments that we had to do because they were required, um, but we didn't necessarily organize them or analyze them in a way that would help provide us with decision making about areas where we needed improvement. Um, and so this idea that came that we developed together as a team around adjusting practice in response to that data analysis was something that is still to this day something that we really talk about. I saw it in the school improvement plans again. Um, if we don't do anything differently, we're not going to get different results. But we can't do anything differently if we don't first analyze our results. 
and we can't analyze our results if we're not organizing them in a meaningful way, right? So those were all of the steps, and that work takes a lot of time. And there's just been a tremendous amount of work that has happened in this area, in the district, that I think the team should be really, really proud of because it is unusual. It's unusual to have that much organization and concentration around really looking at and digging into and analyzing data in a way that can lead, um, lead to decisions about improvement. And I think when we look back over the past five years and we see where, where the standings are as a district still to this day, that doesn't happen by accident, right? It's not, it's planful, it's these kinds of things that are happening behind the scenes. It's not just taking for granted that we're doing a great job. It's looking at our data to say maybe where we're not doing such a great job. And this is something to be really proud of. These are all things that you have supported in various budgets um, over the past, since the beginning of, of the um, strategic plan. I don't even know why full day kindergarten isn't on there, but enough said about that. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that goes without saying. This shared accountability is something that's being embraced, um, but again, takes a while. These things take time to implement and to get um, teacher buy-in to um, the changes that have happened within the district that you've heard about around the need for L teachers, but the idea that we're sharing accountability for success, and it's not just the third grade teacher in the third grade classroom who's responsible um, for how those students are, how her students are, or her students are doing. And then this idea of appropriately engaging with challenging material through effective effort, and you can see the ways in which that's happening. Um, professional development that supports identified teacher needs. This was in reaction to maybe teachers going off to um, a workshop or something that was unrelated to the priorities that were happening within the particular school. Um, this idea about, the, you know, co-teaching, that was a very big deal. When I read that, I thought, oh man, that feels like we've had that forever, but it was only two years ago that that came on, and that was like, met with lots of, but this, it's the idea of sharing responsibility, challenging students, um, and then the schedules that allow for remediation and enrichment. Nothing, none of these great ideas can happen if the schedule doesn't allow for it. So that, again, is the work of our administrative team, challenging themselves to constantly go back and, and ask themselves, where can, we, where can we carve out this time to allow for these kinds of things to happen? And then um, following along that vein for, for FY18, um, it, this idea of shared accountability continuing, uh, but the difference here is, and you can see what's been called out, is articulating and monitoring this growth towards the goal multiple times in a year. So you can see the progression, right, from not having anything to having this coordinated effort to now, you know, raising the bar in terms of how many times a year this is going to be monitored. And then finally, um, this idea of setting student goals that are appropriate for the student but are also, as you can see, tied all back in to their own student growth and the building's school improvement plan. The connection is a powerful one and it's planful and it's intentional. And it, it, again, looking back over time, it feels like it the ideas and having the uh, theories of action helped us to move it along at the right rate and at the right pace. We didn't try to get to where we are now in one year. We knew we had to get there. We evaluated where we were. We changed things along every year as we went. Um, but we tried to stay true to the, the plan as a guideline. And I think it's been really successful. Um, this is looking at educators delivering evidence-based instruction. This was a lot of work. None of this was happening in the district. Using protocols um, to really focus on student engagement, developing um, unit plans that looked at individual needs of students, 
and this idea about opportunities for critical thinking and collaboration communication skills within the instructional day. Um, the one particularly that's tied to the area that I was just talking about with assessment is this using protocols. And it's really been incredible to sit in on teacher meetings where they're analyzing student work and trying to figure out, you know, what do I need to reteach or what have they already mastered or where do we go from here? And I know that that is work that is under the objectives for the upcoming year. Um, so this idea about high expectations. Um, something that's been happening at the high school and I think is going to be happening elsewhere is this idea of peer observation and lesson modeling um, by encouraging teachers to be in each other's classrooms. I know that's been a highly successful model and that's something that will continue. And uh, then using student assessment results to drive instruction. The difference again here being compared to where we were is monitoring this growth towards learning goals as has already been called out multiple times a year and then planning interventions for those students not meeting benchmark. So let's analyze the results, let's know what we're analyzing, then let's do something about it. And the fact that this is going to be looked at several times a year means that it could be different students who are needing some targeted interventions at different times of the year. Um, uh, student assessment. We've, assessment and instruction necessarily bring <coughs> into each other in the ways in which we have developed it in the district. But the first idea is to ensure that the results are readily accessible to educators, administrators, and families. And that's something that has really been worked on, particularly in FY18. Um, and you can see that right here. Uh, this idea of getting the, the results out to students on an ongoing basis, making sure that parents have access to it. It's fairly new. I think that was started this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then using the diagnostic assessments to plan for instruction. Um, I don't think necessarily when you see a heading of assessment that people necessarily tie that to instruction, unless you're Jen and you're a teacher. And then you know <laughs> that that's what you do. Um, and then the objectives for the upcoming year is developing common assessments at all subject grades, at all, sorry, all subject areas at all grade levels, um, continuing to analyze the student learning guide, student learning data, and working collaboratively to establish the learning goals between the teacher and the student. So this is not just something that the teacher's doing in isolation. That's, that's a step up, as you can see, um, to include to, in the students in that in that area. And then finally, leadership governance and communication. When I talked at the beginning about trying to figure out part of what the strategic plan helped us to do is to be able to say, this is principles largely we want you to be concentrating on the three in the middle. Instruction, curriculum, and assessment. And the, the, the two on the sides, the leadership governance and the, the first one, um, was also really around leadership. Let me just grab it. Effective school leadership. Um, I really thought of those as central office kind of drive. And the idea being that these are things that, you know, we'll be managing and those, these will be our responsibilities. So with that in mind, when I looked at 2014-17, I was really looking at really largely my role. Um, so around that, developing and implementing a collaborative budget process and cycle, again, when I think back to our first year um, and where we are now and even the, um, the timing of everything, um, although there continue to be frustrations, of course, uh, I think that we've come a long way. Uh, I know that at the beginning, even our meetings were not all, all televised, for example. Um, so that was a very important beginning process, this collaborative budget process. The school facilities support effective instruction. I think the schools, the facilities have been let go. Um, budget cuts frequently prior to the beginning of this strategic plan. That was a place, that was a go-to place to cut maintenance, to cut building projects. Um, that became a priority to make sure that the school facilities 
we're supporting effective instruction, including, as we've celebrated tonight, a new school. Um, school committee policy, we had a whole subcommittee. We tried all different ways of getting at it. <laughs> um, but I think this has been an ongoing and very important part of our work together, meaning the school committee and myself. Um, and then cultivating effective partnerships amongst departments um, as well. Here are the initiatives for FY18. You can see the collaboration I've listed as examples across town departments that have taken place this year. Um, and then aligning our budget with the school improvement plan so that the things that we were looking for, your support on, were things that we also were aligned with your school improvement plan. Um, these are just examples of uh, partnerships with families and within the community um, as part of my role. And then objectives for next year um, is continuing this idea of a transparent budget that it, it really calls out uh, the SEL part so that we're not taken by surprise. Mm -hmm. Was that where that was coming from? Yes. Yep. And then uh, continuing to cultivate effective partnerships with families. Um, we had some examples tonight of, of some wonderful opportunities with our, in our community, and I can see it beginning and thriving, and um, so these partnerships with families and within the community. That was a lot, but it was a lot to cover, um, and I, I think, um, obviously, leave it to any questions that you have, but I am happy to also... Um, you know, post this, do whatever you want with the report, give you some time to digest it and uh, and provide questions however you want to manage it now. Yeah. Does, does anybody have questions or comments? Want to start down down there? Sure. Um, with you. I'd love to be the first one to start with my <laughs> questions. Uh, this was extremely helpful, Dr. McLeod, to kind of know the history of where you started and how you have tried to, um, you know, chunk it out into different years and tie it with the school improvement plans. And we had certainly seen the school improvement plan um, earlier, um, the last meeting. And so this this is extremely helpful to understand that um, this was not achieved and, you know, what were some of the challenges that you had yeah. in the beginning. Um, so I do have a few questions. I did make a few notes. So just bear with me. Um, so one was related to the peer observations. Yep. Um, this was on the 2018-2019 objectives on the educators deliver effective evidence-based instruction to all students. Um, I think um, Dr. Kavanaugh had spoken about it. I, I think this is an excellent idea to open, um, you know, the classroom to allow other teachers to learn the mm -hmm. best practices. Um, I had certainly, I think I've read an article on Edutopia, if I'm not mistaken, where they put in cameras uh, where the teachers are willing to share that um, and see how that can be learned. I think this is fantastic to do. Um, the other one <coughs> um, that I have is related to um, the student goals, right? We talked about the expectations of uh, students. I'm trying to find where it is that it is not. But I'm just wondering, how is it that we communicate what is the expectation of the child? I mean, we see the assessment, right, as to where they are. I'm wondering, how is it that we communicate what's expected? Um, do you mean in terms of their own goal setting? That's right. Right. So often there's an exemplar. I beg so your pardon? An exemplar often okay. for a student where they can see, let's say it's a writing sample. Sure. Um, here's an exemplar of what would have received top grades. And okay. here's your, your attempt. And helping students to be able to, rather than just look at a number, understand what part of their work um, resulted in them gaining that score. And it, that, that can be a hard battle, right? Because we all want to just go to the last page and see what grade we got. Um, but, but really having students self-evaluate so that they can understand for themselves where the gap is would be an example of helping them to be part of the goal setting. I see. Yeah. I guess what I was um, thinking, and maybe this is something we discuss offline a little mm -hmm. bit, is to see um, how can we 
communicate that in a fashion. I think you talked about consistency, how in the past it was, um, you know, some of the assessments were not right. consistent. So could the goal setting also be something consistent and something that can also be shared uh, with parents too? And is there a possibility that parents are also aware that this is the expectation for the child? Mm -hmm. And I don't know at what level we would start that. Again, I'm happy to have it mm -hmm. offline. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question for if you want to jump in or for admin council. Sure. I think um, even at the, you know, very early ages, our kids are actually doing that sort of goal setting. So, you know, even as a child is reading, for example, we may talk to them about, you know, your comprehension probably needs a little bit of work and these are some of the comprehension strategies that you can use. So in the forefront of that student's mind, they're thinking about what are the things that I need to do as a reader when I'm struggling with, you know, X. Um, Dr. McLeod's example of writing is wonderful. So at Hopkins, what has happened with the SRSD writing is that they will break the kids into like four groups, for example, kids who are um, very proficient writers, kids who are sort of average writers, and kids who are struggling writers. So that as if I'm a very proficient writer, some of the things that I might think about working on um, are things like how do I have more voice in my writing or how do I engage in different kinds of sentence writing. But if I'm a struggling writer, I might just be thinking about what does the content look like? What is it that should be in here and how might I organize that information? So we move toward more discrete skills and kids have a sense of what is it that I'm very good at as a writer and what do I need to work on as a writer. And I know that, you know, even in, um, like at Element, for example, if we have kids who have, you know, sort of mathematic struggles, so I may not have very good uh, number sense, for example, you know, a kid will know that and play those kinds of number games frequently that will improve their number sense. So while it's not sort of formal goal setting that I sit down and write it out, there's a sense that teachers are constantly telling kids what it is that they, you know, the areas that they need to work on, the things that they're very good at, the things that they're proficient at, and, and kids have an understanding of those. Yeah. And I think that there's a host of research that says when kids know what it is that they need to work on, oh, absolutely. they will absolutely, you know. Absolutely. I, I do think that goal, goal setting is something that helps all of us uh, to have a goal uh, and also the high expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just hope, you know, wa wondering if that is something that could be formalized and shared. Uh, but again, happy to continue the conversation. Sure. Um, I don't mean to hold while I'm looking at questions. It's okay. You got another one? I do, somewhere <laughs> hidden. <laughs> Go, Jen, um, and I'll come back to mine. I don't really have questions. I was jotting down notes as you were speaking, but I feel like this is kind of like a, a little bit of a report card and a little bit of a foreshadow of what's next, right? I mean, this is what's already happened and then sort of what's coming up next year. Um, so it's, I think that, um, you know, there's been great things. I jump in in this perfect position, you know, where already so many great things have started and we still have a couple more years to go with this plan. So I think um, hearing the things that have already been accomplished, I mean, a lot of them we kind of already knew. We've already talked about them. We've heard about them from the folks who are in the trenches. So um, I'm excited about what's been accomplished under your leadership and I'm looking forward to what's going to be accomplished coming up and I really do think we, you know, some great things have happened and everyone seems to have such a good outlook so yeah. you know great makes me happy to hear okay, back to me if that's okay <laughs> sure. sorry no I'm, geez, I'm done um, I'm done there is one I, um, slide related to encouraging a culture of shared accountability for student success, and it talks to grade three and five teachers to address optimal class size. Why is it restricted to grade three and five, and what is an optimal class size? So uh, are you talking, it would help me if I knew under what year, your, is it 14-17, is it FY18, I'm sorry, because your slide isn't numbered. That's right. That, um, that's is it under sorry. assessment? Not for me to tell. I'm sorry. Perhaps under effective instruction. Okay. Oh, yeah. This really referred to the so this this idea of shared accountability. Yes. Um, the word that is missing there that would have been extremely helpful is adding. <laughs> So the reason those are called out is that we had to add additional teachers at those grade levels in order to address optimal class size. So looking at shared accountability meant that we had to make some difficult budget decisions. In this case, we 
really knew that at both the grade three and at the grade five level, our numbers were above 25, Mina. So anything above 25 would just, we would say at the grade third, three and five level, that optimal would be 20 to 23. Um, and we were getting above 25 in both those grade levels. Which is okay. painful. So that's why. Oh, yes, of course. Um, of course. Um. So these are things that were done. You know, we added the teacher, the visually impaired. We brought on L teachers. These were all to help with a shared accountability for success, in addition to additional classroom teachers to be able to meet student needs by addressing class size. Thank you. Um, just two more, I promise. Uh, one, uh, again, in the 2018-2019 objectives about developing a consistently implemented and vertically aligned pre-K to 12 curriculum, it talks about differentiation in reading and writing programs K through 12. I recall um, seeing differentiation in the school improvement plans even for lower grades. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Is that an FY18? Uh, it says 18... Uh, 2019, yes, 1819 objectives under effective instruction, I think. Oh, under, where it says 6 to 12, you mean? Yeah, I think that's you. Yes. Sure. So what we, uh, I think the reason that we put that in there as a priority objective for reading and writing is 6 to 12. Uh, we already do that K to 5. So, you know, we have guided reading so if I'm reading at a level J and you're reading at a level G you know we ensure that kids are accessing text where they are but we really haven't been doing that consistently in the middle school so one of the things that Mr. Keller and I have talked about is you know in addition to more of that kind of landmark training if you are an eighth grader for example you're all reading to kill a mockingbird at one time and we would really like for kids to still be able to access to kill a mockingbird but if we build what i call multimodal multi-genre text sets then i might have a kid who is a super proficient reader reading to kill a mockingbird and that person might get the Malcolm Gladwell article that was in the New Yorker maybe 10 years ago that talks about Atticus Finch as the Great White Hope, right? And then it will ask that question, um, is the text still relevant today? Are, you know, heroes necessarily white? Those kinds of questions where um, a student who is a less proficient reader just might read um, an article about the Scottsboro Boys trial that is sort of the incident on which that novel is based. So we really want to differentiate that reading experience in the middle school, and I think that we've started to do that with writing as well. And we've, um, in addition to looking at that in the middle school, we've gathered a whole lot of data this year at the high school level, and Sarah Ellum, who is the subject matter leader there, has kept all kinds of data on kids' reading levels based on what we learned from STAR and from MCAS. And so what we're hoping to do at the high school as well is to make sure that kids are accessing text at the right levels, but really thinking about them in sort of mature and high school-esque ways. So to make the literature, I think, more relevant, um, but also, I guess, kind of consistent in the sense that there would be an anchor text in supporting texts. That makes sense. Sure. Um, and one last question is, you know, obviously you didn't have a crystal ball when you started planning this out in 2014, and a lot of new things were thrown in, like diversity, and I saw that in the school improvement plan at high school and middle school, and we heard from Dilzafar, you know, some of the things that the kids are facing at very early grades. How do you plan for some of that, or student growth that we have had? Um, you know, can you speak a little bit to that as to how you have had to adjust the plan and the implementation of it? And as we get into the next year, are there things, um, you know, from you and the outgoing school committee members, if there are thoughts and ideas that you would want to share with us? You know, that, that is such a great question, Mina, because that is the most challenging question, right? And not having the crystal ball. So a great, a great deal of time was spent as part of developing this plan in terms of having community forums, looking at the, the wealth of data that we had within the district to try to figure out where the needs were. So there was a lot of things that were looked at, but you call out the unexpected. And what immediately comes to my mind is that's why we like to have a salary reserve. And that's why we like to have a budget with some flexibility that this year has been so challenging, as we all know, 
going into next year um, because only because we had those things were we able to move some things around, make some tough decisions, and in the middle of the year hire not one but two L teachers because of the unexpected and incredible increase in the numbers of students needing those services that we there was no way our crystal ball would have anticipated. Um, we were anticipating enrollment all along. We always anticipated a class, number of classrooms that we were going to need. As you know, we held off on, on the numbers that we were going to need at the marathon because there was no more room at the center school anyway. Um, but those unexpected move-ins um, with specific student needs, those are the ones that we grapple with around budgeting. And there were times this year where we had to take, for example, curriculum money, professional development money, um, central office mater materials in order to put together enough money to hire the teacher. And I know that we came to you last summer when, with unexpected growth that required additional paraprofessionals at the center school. And again, we, we had the advantage last year of being able to have prepaid um, a huge, I think, the entire transportation budget for except last year. So there was some comfort there, but that's the answer to your question. You know, it, it, it is the, the thing that we grapple with most, and knowing that we have a solid plan that guides our overall planning is great, but it does not take care of the unexpected, and um, that's what we're... That's why this year has been so tough going into next year because we worry about where that places us. Building some buffers and yeah. being prepared for that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John, did you? So just really quickly, I, I just want to say, I, going back to 2014 when we put this together, a couple of the things that I know you and I talked a lot about in this process was what you articulated earlier, which is a, a great strategy is an articulation not only of what it is we plan to do, but what it is we plan not to do. Yeah. And so the fact that those choices were made in 2014 um, allow not only for the focus that drove the results that we've seen here, but also to the question about the unexpected, this is how you don't end up with 350 priority initiatives, right? Right, yeah. because because there are going to be some things that you don't have a choice. So, so I think that that's from a strategic planning perspective, one thing that you and and your team did extremely well, which is make those hard choices at the strategic level, mm -hmm. so that we didn't have to make them at the budgetary level, mm -hmm. um, where it gets even harder. True enough. And then the other piece is is we have effective. We I think we have effectively lined up that idea that it's there's the strategy, there's the budget. And then there's the execution plans, which are, for us, the school improvement plans. And that's where, I know in this summary you put in some of those actual, like the actual work, but yeah. what I like about it is that when we discuss the strategic plan, we should be discussing those strategic decisions. Yeah. And, and the execution of it goes in those school improvement plans. I think in addition to leaving all of this great work as a legacy, the strategic planning and execution process that you've built, I think, is going to serve this district extremely well for years to come. So I think that's got equally as much value as actually the results in this deck. So, mm -hmm. Thank you, John. So I, I appreciate the look back in part mm. because I wasn't here to be part of that strategic plan and, right. and hope to be here when we go <laughs> do it again. I, I also really, it, it seems so appropriate today when we've celebrated so many of the successes that you and, and John and Jane have had, it really calls out so many where this district has come in that time. And it, it's tremendous. It can't be, it can't be overstated. But it, that is, it, work also that shows where we're going from here. I love the direction. And I echo what John said, that it, there are some things that I know have come before that people would have loved to have done. But we can't do everything in one time. And I think it's great to have a guiding a, a compass to lead us forward and to figure one out. Of the, one of the advantages and you know the seamlessness between the leadership that you have here Again, we did not have a chance to collaborate on this. Mm -hmm. um, the way in which, I mean, the, the, where we are going forward, that is all Dr. Kavanaugh's work with Mr. Ghosh, with 
um, Dr. Zaleski with central office, administration, all work that she has done with the team to guide their work going forward. And, you know, the fact that that could happen without even a conversation goes to show just, you know, how, how well this yeah. transition has worked. Um, and that makes me feel really, really great. Um, because you, this is such an important document, and um, and I agree. I think that the goals are they're directed. They're the most important ones. They're what's going to continue to to move things forward, um, and they are big, but they're focused enough that you're really going to be able to accomplish some exciting things. Yes, it's exciting. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, I really echo what. John and Nancy just said in terms of the system and the, sort of the pr process that, that you've put in place through this strategic plan is what will really set us up for success going forward. Um, I think, you know, just obviously it's a moment to reflect that we are all facing now. And I, you know, I think when you came here five years ago, we were in a pretty fragile state in a lot of ways as a community, as a, as a leadership team. And I think, um, your unique ability to craft this plan, to mastermind it, to help people understand what was and was not on their plate, and bring all of those pieces together, um, and just maintain fidelity to the plan when we are faced with you know unpredictable challenges that need to be dealt with, but maintaining integrity to this plan, infusing it across all of the other the work that's being done so that it is a living document for all of um, all of the people involved in it. I think if at the beginning, five years ago, you had said, hi, I'm Kathy McLeod, and we're going to build a building, we're going to have full decay, we're going to have co-teaching, we're going to build some fields, we're going to change our traffic configuration and build some parking lots, and we're going to do, I don't know, 65 other things. When we were all feeling like there's too much going on already, people would have looked at you like you had three heads. But somehow, You've broken that down, and you've gotten us. We've accomplished a tremendous amount of work in a relatively short period of time. And I don't want to say we didn't break a sweat, but we worked really hard. But I never, I never had the sense that people were overwhelmed. And I think that that's a credit to how you managed it. You are a force, and you had a vision, and you you brought it all together. And so. That is why it's no accident that we're on the top of every rating, and that is why it's no accident that we have the strength of the team that we have here. You helped us learn to trust each other, to trust you, to have difficult and challenging conversations, and to come out with a better result because of that. So, um, so I truly thank you for your leadership. I think that was an outstanding summary of what has been happening for the last many years, and it's a daunting challenge to continue, yes. but I know that you guys are up for it, so Absolutely. I look forward to watching from the sidelines, but um, it's just, we have learned, created, and achieved together. Yeah, we have, right? we have so, done so. That's been good. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. And I will take my exit if that is okay. Well, we are going to talk about some really exciting amendments to our Gale contract, but if you can live without it, that's well, all right. I'm My wonderful husband has been here throughout <laughs> all of this excitement today, and uh, I'm conscious of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing her back. Um, thank you very thank you. much. And we'll thank see you. you at the groundbreaking. You will. Thank you. Um, all right, I know we've jumped around a little bit, so we'll try to get back on track. Um, it appears that we have no student council members here for our student council report, so we'll jump right to the F-1 visa program update with um, Mr. Hanna. Do I have to touch a special button here? Are we good with Ooh, my you're on. Okay, excellent. Good evening, school committee. Thank you. Getting the presentation online. Just a second with Dr. McLeod and John and Jean. Uh, with so many nice things being said about the work you've all done, 
Um, I can't help but remember in the early 90s when the district was in a tough spot as a student, there were school committee members, particularly uh, Anne Marie Sullivan and Marie Eldridge, come to mind who really spearheaded uh, change here in Hopkinton to bring about uh, overrides in the building of this school that we're sitting in this evening. And I feel like you've carried on that legacy of hard work and caring about education and believing in the work that goes on and supporting it. And so I thank you. It's been very nice getting to know you both over the last five years. And so I wish you uh, well in your post-school committee work. But sincerely thank you as a, someone who cares uh, deeply about Hopkinton Public Schools and uh, from an administrative perspective, been able to see that uh, in, in my uh, role here at the high school. So thank you both very much for that and good luck. Uh, so in terms of our international program, I was asked tonight to come and give a little bit of an update. And we... Um, you know, I chose a quote from a historical figure that I enjoyed teaching when I was working as a history teacher in Natick High a few years ago, and Gandhi once said, you know, you need to um, be the change you wish to see in the world, and we look at our world of 7 billion plus today and the conflict that occurs around it, and it brings great sadness uh, to me and, and, and to others who understand that humans do want to get along, but oftentimes it's just a matter of getting over the understanding of one another to get there. And I think we can all agree that when you spend time and have dinner with someone or uh, spend a weekend getting to know, all of a sudden they're a lot uh, nicer or you can uh, understand their perspective at a deeper level, right? And so our F1 program does that at a local level. We every year bring students in from all over the world, as you can see on the slideshow. Uh, in the last few years, we've brought students from Brazil and China, all the way uh, to Thailand, to Vietnam, etc. You can uh, read the countries where they're coming from. Uh, in an effort to, at a very young age for our students, get to know one another at a personal level, <coughs> uh, spending time in class, studying history and math and English together. And the hope is, among other things, that as they move on in life, uh, and, and people may bring up ideas of, oh, well, those people or these types of statements that are against our big ideas, are against what we believe is uh, what humans want to do. They'll say, I, I actually disagree. I, I spent time studying with someone from that land and when we were 15 and we became great friends. Uh, so I think it's time to maybe press pause and not go down that road. And to me, that's the big idea of our international program. Uh, and in an interesting moment, two days ago, a student who graduated a couple years ago from France, who's now studying at UMass, came up behind me as I was uh, paying for my gas, and his name was Tim Duplantier, and he was so excited. To, Mr. Hanna, how's it going? I'm at, I'm at UMass doing so well, and he's still staying with his host family here, and made a great connection. And uh, although France oftentimes is considered a great ally of the United States, there have been moments in the last 10 years where they haven't been necessarily spoken uh, about um, in, in positive ways. And so that's like a prime example of what I'm talking about. Students at Hopkinton who watched Tim come in and was an amazing handball player, taught us a new game, and, and has gone on to study here at our U, uh, University of Massachusetts system and is now making friends and is still very comfortable interacting here at a local gas station. To me, that's what the program's all about. Uh, and so in an effort to try to make that even more uh, intimate, uh, you can see some pictures as our Ambassadors Club, which is run by Mr. Andy Longoria and Ms. Laura Tice, who are two teachers here at the high school, has grown. We've made stronger connections with our Hopkinton students. So this past year, uh, they participated in uh, traveling to football games and apple picking, uh, winter parties. They went ice skating, went to the Apex Center in Marlboro. And you can see some highlights, really enjoying time with one another. And to me, this is what it's all about. Uh, if we truly want to have a peaceful world, then it starts at this young age. And, and uh, I'm very proud to have participated in this program and, and use these pictures as a sign of evidence that uh, it's moving into right, in the right direction. Uh, in terms of American and college universities, I have on the, on the bottom slide there, I'm busy right now transferring the I-20s to uh, many schools, University of Michigan, Indiana University, uh, UMass Amherst, Boston University, UConn. These are all students that come to the United States of America, studied and are graduating from Hopkinton High School on June 1st, and are going to continue their education here in this country. So it doesn't just stop here after this one-year experience. It's going to carry on and grow and allow for our country, which has for so long been open to the idea of welcoming from all over the world, just that it continues that same pattern. 
Uh, finally, is in terms of uh, budgetary kind of observations or questions. Uh, we bring in students on two separate uh, paths, either a semester or a full year, and we're um, you know kind of bound economically to the uh, guidelines of the uh, justice of the um, I'm sorry, Homeland Security and State Department regarding what our tuition can uh, sit at, which is no more than a particular number above what we are per pupil expenditure is. So for us in Hopkinton, it's right around $14,000. That allows us to uh, charge that for tuition for one year study. And in the past couple of years, with your gracious support, we've been able to increase the number of students from beneath 15 to up to 20. Uh, including a one J1 student, which is a non-tuition student. It's a true exchange, and the programs that we work with J1 students then offer Hopkinton students a free exchange at different parts of the year. So that's kind of the breakdown of our cohort. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you, and that was a picture of uh, our ambassadors and our 2017-18 students. Uh, this is this past August, and we welcomed them at the end of August uh, last school year. Sorry, it's very brief, but I'm trying to keep up the pace for you. <laughs> Read the room. Yeah. 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 I think this is fantastic, Mr. Hannah. And, you know, you rightly said that the immersion that you're providing to these kids and your experience at the gas station, that's what it's all about. Um, so I think it's fantastic that these kids are getting this opportunity. Um, just one question that came to my mind, um, do we ever get... Uh, children with special needs from these countries? Well, that's a good question. We attempt to create, uh, bring in as diverse a cohort as possible, but with understanding the limitations on our uh, current system, we don't want to, um, you know, create uh, unnecessary burdens. So we have standards regarding their ability to read and write in the English language, which kind of eliminates, in many instances, students that are coming in with um, challenges beyond that of, of a kind of a typical student, so to speak. But that doesn't stop us from wanting to create the most diverse cohort as possible. Uh, Andy Longoria does a wonderful job Skype interviewing with all of the students that come from the many different companies we work with to try to make sure they'll be a good fit. You know, it's, uh, it's a difficult task as a high school student to spend a year in a faraway land, and so we want to make sure that they're ready to engage with us and, and take advantage. Uh, so that's kind of what goes into our decision points regarding who we, who we move forward. Our biggest goal, frankly, is to bring as many students from as many places as possible. And that's why on the previous slide we had a number of companies uh, kind of represented. The reason we work with so many different companies is because they all have kind of locations in different parts of the world that they have positive relationships with. So we're not so interested in aligning with one group. We're more interested in bringing the world to us. Uh, and as long as we can continue to do that, this program is going to uh, succeed. That's fantastic. Great job. Thank you. My only comment is we just spoke for a while about effective school leadership, and this is a perfect example of, you know, your leadership is, for this program, huge. I mean, last year I remember sitting here for the, like, you know, my, one of my first meetings hearing about it, and I didn't even know it existed at that moment, so it's so incredibly amazing to hear about it a second year and see that the number of kids are increasing. and. So you do amazing things for that program, and I think it's, I just love hearing the, the success of it. Well, we have great students, and they bring in a whole other perspective to the table. So to me, that adds to our classes, our history classes in particular, to have those types of, um, you know, perspectives really adds and, and uh, takes it to the next level, in my opinion. Good job. Thanks. Um, just an operational question. I mean, I huge fan of this program so we have 21 students this year um do we are we, are we turning students away yes okay We're so one of the most highly sought after school districts in the entire country okay so for we have many more applications than we do uh allow you know have seats so the which answers my second question which is the tuition level so that's not that's not dissuading people so no good no, not at all okay no i think this is a, a great program i love seeing that it's such a success continuing echo what they said and and also just to add that my own children who have been through the high school have every year found friends within this group and how much they add to the entire culture of the high school so well done Great. yeah i think this is one of the first um initiatives that i that i remember being involved in when i joined the school committee and um, i have to say so i mean i've enjoyed seeing the program grow over the years but in particular mr hannah i think you really have 
taking it to a whole other level in terms of integrating the kids and more deeply into the culture here in the high school and to the student body. I think, you know, for the first couple of years, they felt a little bit more um, isolated. And I just, I really love to see how well they're embraced by the whole school and the cultural nights and the cultural events and speak, having them speak to the whole, um, you know, community I, I just think is exceptional so I think you know it's one thing to have a program and it's another thing to really get meaning out of the program and I think that that's something that you absolutely have added and continue to grow every year so I, I really am so appreciative of all that you've done and I think it's a great opportunity and with my youngest going to college maybe I need to have a chat with my husband and see if we can uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, if we he's definitely not watching could anymore. Use great host fam. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, host a couple. Yeah, I know. We have some empty bedrooms in the Birchman household, but uh, no, it's a, it's just a fantastic program. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Yeah, thank you all. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, since the theme of the evening is jumping around, I'm going to ask your indulgence and see if we could um, move to new business A and invite Mrs. Wright up so she doesn't have to sit through the rest of our reports. <laughs> some great stuff bit, in there. I know, but we're a little behind schedule, all for good reason, but I see some people who no doubt have busy days sitting out there, so come right on up. So, yes, uh, as you probably know, the, the Historical Commission is going to be making a request to install at the new Marathon Elementary School a display sign honoring Emily Poulson, uh, educator, kindergarten advocate, teacher of the blind, uh, and a Hopkinton benefactor and um, particular benefactor of the Hopkinton Library. So I have, um, I'm really just a facilitator. I haven't been on the Historical Commission for two years, but I've been working to kind of help get this project finished before the funding runs out uh, and doing some of the legwork. So um, we have uh, Beth Watson here to represent the Historical Commission to tell a little bit about the project and officially make the request. And we're fortunate enough to have Linda Connolly, who's um, the Historic Resources Librarian for the Public Library as well as for the Historical Society. And she's going to just take a couple moments to tell you a little about Emily Poulsen and why she is significant. And I wish Kathy McLeod were still here, but some of you who went to the Historical Society's notable Women of Hopkinton program in 2017, I think. Kathy portrayed Emily Poulsen beautifully and her hands-on learning style for children, particularly for the blind. Um, and then I will just show you what we have uh, as a proposal for the sign. I, I have a draft here, but I'll turn it first over to first over to Beth. Uh, and if you want to share this too, is a sample of what we're talking about. I'll just pass this around. Um, this is I'll try to I'll try to go quickly. No pressure. But basically, like she said, uh, we are developing. Uh, some historic, some signs with information for various historic sites in town. And included in that are some of the buildings in town and the sites that had old schools. Um, and in the process of researching all of this, um, Claire found out that uh, where the Marathon School was, was built is where Emily Polson used to have a property. Um, and so we thought it would be nice to put a uh, plaque somewhere on the property there um, talking about Emily, Pol Emily Polson and her um, contributions to education, especially elementary school um, and kindergarten. Um, so basically, I think we just need to get your approval to go ahead and do that. I think it's up to you all where we put the sign. Um, that I actually didn't even look too closely at that, but I think that's an example of one of the other signs. Yeah, there's a series of them. The picture shows one of the other ones around town. There's a similar one on the uh, Center Trail, yes. on Echo Trail, mm -hmm. and the little piece that you have is just a manufacturer's sample of the, of the material that's on a metal on a metal frame, but it's just talking to the colors and all. Yeah, so I think we're putting um, a sign on um, Ash Street. I have a list, don't you know, I? Um, on the, uh, I'm thinking of the schoolhouses. No, no, yeah, those, those are bronze plaques, but we've got some of these going um, 
at the ice house to tell about the ice harvesting, the train depot, the railroad. Yeah. There were some up on Center Trail. Um, there's this one on East Main Street. So there's a series kind of going around town. So, do you want to speak a little bit about sure, Emily? Sure, sure, and it'll be very quick. Um, so, thank you for having me here. Um, thank you, Claire, for inviting me. She found out she lived at 133 Hayden Road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she was, uh, Emily Polson was her name, actually Anne Emily Polson. Um, I think from the little that I have read about her that we can really say that she was a very remarkable person. Uh, she lived seven years from 1906 to 1913 in the town. But I think that she likely had quite an impact on the community with the, with the readers in the library and with the library community. Um, she was an advocate for small children and for uh, early education at a time when that was not commonplace. Um, there was a woman who used to come in the library named Cecilia Tan who was in the process of writing a book about Polson. And, and I came across her information, um, kind of added it to what I had figured out myself, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. So she was born in 1853 in New Jersey, but she came to Perkins School for the Blind in Massachusetts uh, because she herself had um, very poor vision. She graduated there, and in 1881, she created a kindergarten program there for, for the blind. Um, I also figured out that she was teaching there when Ann Sullivan, who was um, Helen Keller's famous teacher, was there for probably a period of two years. Ann Sullivan would have been 14 years old at that time. Um, so she became part of what was known as the kindergarten movement, and she spoke about early education. She traveled despite having impaired vision herself. Um, I'm not sure how extensively, but in America, um, advocating for early education and for kindergarten. Uh, I also know that her sister was an invalid. Her name was Laura, and they came here for the fresh air so that Laura could heal. Um, and we know that she lived at 133 Hayden Row Street, at least for a period of time. She might have moved from a different location on Hayden Row, too. Uh, earlier, but we know she taught Braille. She was a private tutor for the blind. She wrote and published dozens of books. We have many of them at the library. Here's her most famous one. It was called Finger Plays. This was in publication for about 50 years, so it was written in the 1890s, but people were still reading it and they were still printing it uh, into, the eight, into the 1930s. Uh, she wrote poetry. She was published in um, children's literary magazines, um, and there were articles written about her in the 1920s doing that. But more significantly for the town of Hopkinton, so she did all of these things, um, educator, translator, um, traveler, um, but here she was an advocate for children at the public library. Uh, we know that she started a children's reading group and that she wrote little poems for them. Um, and this again was at a time when there was not, this was not happening in libraries or in, in schools. And her famous poem, books are keys to wisdom's treasure, books are gates to lands of pleasure, books are paths that upward lead, books are friends, come let us read. Um, it's now considered a somewhat famous quote. It's in a book that is published with called uh, Familiar Quotations. But it's, it's assumed that she wrote that poem just for the children in her Hopkinton reading group. Um, so she had a little tiny library within the library. And we know that she also presented, um, and this is not the original one. This is a copy of it, but she presented a photograph, an original photograph of Helen Keller to the library, and that I wrote a paper on this when I was in library school. Here is the provenance indicating that the photograph was given to the library for, um, by Emily Polson. I also know that she had other prominent women friends in the town. Uh, there was a, a very early female lawyer in the town named El Eliza Bridges. She owned some uh, books that were written by Polson also. So just a wonderful woman, very interesting. Um, she traveled with her invalid sister by steamship back to Norway um, to visit her family there. So 
After her sister died in 1913, she returned to Beacon Street in Brookline. Um, and I know that she died in, in Brookline at age 85. But I like to think if she were around today, she would be coming to the library. She'd be advocating again for early education with children and just a lover of books and a writer of books. And she invented this a technique for teaching that were called finger plays. So if you think of the itsy bitsy spider, um, it's just another way to relate to children and teaching using hand movements um, to sort of make the learning process more memorable and fun. So a really remarkable person, and I think it would be great to have a plaque remembering her. Thank you. So that's it. Thank you. So what uh, all these, the series of signs that we have been doing, they're all um, about 36 inches long by 18 inches. It's a two-post in-ground display sign um, consistent with those Hopkinton colors that you saw, the green title band, the kind of Hopkinton orange. Uh, <laughs> we'll call it gold. <laughs> for the text with a variety of illustrations. And this is just sort of a, sort of a draft that I've made up um, with the story of, of Emily Poulsen. She, she really, as Linda said, was an advocate for kindergarten education when kindergarten was a new, was a new concept. Um, and she lectured throughout, well, I don't know how far around the country. I know we have advertisements of her um, coming to, going to St. Louis, speaking in Boston, renowned kindergarten advocate. She was a real force for um, kindergarten as the important transition from home to school for little children. And um, of course, these finger plays that she did, she learned it um, and it became very helpful for the blind children because you were using finger motions uh, and she also worked a lot with poetry and rhythm and sound and that she found that the types of learning that helped blind children were also very effective in preschool, in, in young ages. So she sort of blended the two. Um, and of course, when she came to Hopkinton, she became a huge advocate, not only for children's education, but um, for reading. And as Linda said, the idea of a children's room, now all the libraries have children's room, but they didn't back then. And she founded this children's room in Hopkinton. She gave over 200 volumes of books for children to Hopkinton. Um, there's a, these are some photographs of some of, some of the covers of her, of her children's books. Um, dear little poem about them, she says, I had indicted I can't read this without my glasses. <laughs> I have invited thee with care and love, my little book, and now I send thee forth on a good mission in sweet homes to be a loving guest and find a place in many a guileless heart. <laughs> and uh, so we, we feel that between her living for a while on the site of the Marathon School yeah. and really being a promoter to bring kindergarten education into the American school system. An example she was for teaching the way we love the Hoyt statue at, uh, at, at Center School, her advocacy for teaching, teaching children with impairments. And then she had this great affinity uh, for Hopkinton with what she did for our library. Um, we just feel that uh, this kind of a display sign at the Marathon School somewhere on the grounds, I'm sure we could work with the grounds committee to decide where the right place would be in one grassy space. Um, it's interesting for parents, and there's a, there's a dear little poem I have here, uh, Puppy Problem, which I won't read completely to you, but she, it's the problem the puppy has of how do I learn when to bite and when not to bite, and when not to bark. What a problem. Um, <laughs> cute, cute children's poem. So I will just pass this around uh, as just sort of a draft illustration of what we would do. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions, but as I don't know if Beth mentioned to you, part of the reason we're kind of in a hurry to do this is um, the funds run out the funds June 30th. Out. It Got was it. supposed to be a CPC project, and at the last minute, uh, our town council informed the Community Preservation Committee that you could not use historic preservation funds for historic signs. Oh. Go figure. So there was a scurry to turn it into a warrant article, which it was, but being a warrant article, uh, and that was on the 2016 warrant. So two years, okay. it sunsets June 30th, so we need to get, we've got the other ones all on order and we'd like to get this one um, okay. set up as well if you would give us your support and permission. 
Does anybody have questions, comments? Oh, this is fantastic. And, you know, I've met Linda so many times and Claire too, but I didn't know that you did this kind of research. So I have much to learn from you. <laughs> uh, this, she sounds so amazing. She well, was amazing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you said a guileless heart. A guileless heart. Yeah. It sounds like. She's just, the more you learn about her, she's just such an amazing lady. And to think that she did most of this largely blind and as a woman at a time when women um, didn't have, they didn't have the even vote. Yeah, and she, right. never, she didn't marry and she took care of her invalid sister who also worked with her for yeah. children, the mm -hmm. cause of early children. education she for really children. She was really a giant for women yeah. in her age, so. Fantastic. Great. Be a nice, a nice, uh, it's a wonderful life. And Emily would be. She'd be Emily happy would be about it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, and she used to live on the site. I know. I, I mean, know. that's kind of karma right there. Yeah. 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 It just kind of seems like, yeah, yeah. it was meant to be. Any other that's questions? Thoughts? This is, has nothing, this is mechanical. <laughs> Can we accept the gift? Well, right, because we don't, we don't have technically it have the school yet but we will and it's town money it's one one are we accepting I guess we can, for the school well no my question so my question was actually can we accept the yeah i guess we can i mean i guess we're accepting the gift i i'm i believe that this is a gift to the, to the district to the district and so and we're not saying where it's wherever going. we should, should choose to locate it um <laughs> which i think coincidentally would be at the property that will soon be part of the district would probably be just fine. It's just so the glitch is that we don't currently own that property. It's actually owned by the construction management company, right, John? Yes. So, so that's the only. And I just didn't want to accept it and then have somebody tell us we legally couldn't and have to reverse yeah. this whole thing. So I think you're right. We'll accept it as the district, and then it's probably um, for a meeting we're not at to. To, to, to put it on the next where year. to put it. Yeah. Uh, because that would actually it actually won't. The, or whatever it is, right? the yeah. ribbon cutting is the after May. the next after school it. committee. Yeah, so maybe the second one in June. Yeah. 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 And okay. it doesn't need to be installed by June 30th, just the money has to be encumbered. When will we, the town, own the property? June 9th, I think is Well, right. that's what the. All it's, we need right. the now target. Yeah. That is the goal. Is permission to move forward. Yeah. Right, which Gene is right. We can accept the yeah, gift we and be, we're not putting it up yet. Okay. We're here to give until sometime yep. in the summer. Yeah. We okay. It doesn't have to be installed by June 30th, just no, no. purchased. No, just paid permission so that we get the order done. Exactly. Um, but it won't be here until the summertime. Hopefully it would be nice to get in by the time the school opens, but by that time, we'll own the property. Yes, right. right. So it I would think be we're, inappropriate to open it if we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then I think we're I think we're just accepting the gift, right? We're not we're skipping the other motion to install. Right. Uh, we're, yes. We're not, yeah. Okay. All right. So then you can get it made. All right. Yeah. Yes. I, when it comes to it, how about a few? Yeah, you should definitely make that motion. I just want to make. I just, I just want to make sure that I'm not leaving part of leaving a something that has to be undone. Exactly. No, I think that's good. We'll Thank call you. you back if you do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you all you for do. bringing this forward to us because I think it is an amazing confluence of events in the world, right, uh, of circumstance that um, we happen to be building that building mm -hmm. on, on the property that she lived on with her focus on, you know, the exact um, profile of student who will be attending that school. So I think that's, um, I mean, it's just very fitting, particularly because our integrated preschool is also on that property. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes life just comes full circle and I think it's a really um, wonderful thing. So thank you very much for including us in your project. Um, for including her in your project. We have had some conversations with the principal and the superintendent about where a good location might be, a highly visible location. So um, we'll do that once we actually own the land. But, um, but I see no reason that we can't, um, we can't accept the gift tonight. So I assume this is your recommendation as well. Yes, I would recommend that the school committee accept the gift of the plaque from the Historical Commission. So moved. Second. It's actually a sign. I mean, it's not a plaque. It's a, it's a display sign. All right. I think I heard you say to accept the gift I, of a sign. That's what I heard. That was definitely the motion I made. All right. So that was a motion by um, John, a second by Jen. All in favor? Yes. 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 yes.
and I'm a yes. So that is unanimous. Thank you very, very much. May I ask just one question? Sure. How do you recommend we go about who should we contact with to determine the location? Mm -hmm. Because we will leave it up to the powers that be that to decide where's the best spot to put it on the site. I think between yeah, I think between um, Carol and Lauren Debeau, they can decide. We had talked about maybe along the path that links it to the EMC park because I think it'll get a lot of traffic there with kids going back and forth in particular. But that is for we'll greater minds than mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, you so good much. Good nice. Thank, thank you. Nice. They get all there. Props there yeah, too. Okay. It's just a fantastic <laughs> night. I know. I know. Great. It's really amazing. All right. So on yeah, the feel good yeah, theme, yeah, we're ready yeah. for I'll tell your you report, Dr. Kavanaugh. Oh yes. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> so I just have a couple of things. Um, we did learn from HEF that they have approved fifty-five thousand nine hundred and twenty-eight dollars wow. worth of grants this year. Um, so I think that they are going out to nine different requesters. So that's really exciting, and we are grateful to them for all that yeah. they do for us. Um, the other things are just things that are going on in our schools. Tomorrow will be the end of AP testing. Um, I had the great fortune of attending my very first Grand March, and that was an amazing experience. Um, the underclassmen awards, I believe, are tomorrow, and um, I think that that's about it for me. Excellent. What's going on in the schools? Thank you. Okay, so for my report, I will announce that during our executive session, we um, reviewed and approved the minutes of executive session meetings from December 14th, 2017, March 15th, 2018, April 12th, 2018, May 3rd, 2018. We released the minutes of December 14th, 2000, and I mean, released as redacted the minutes of December 14th, 2017, released as redacted the minutes of March 15th, 2018, released the minutes of April 12th, 2018, and released the minutes of May 3rd, 2018. And in addition, um, we reviewed the supporting documentation from April 12th, 2018, and voted not to release that material. And we did um, review the supporting documentation from May 3rd, 2018, and voted to release that material. So that is the recap, I believe, of our um, review of our executive session minutes. Additionally, I've approved for payment the payroll warrant S18023, and those warrants have been included in your packet. And then um, I wanted to read, we received a thank you note from, um, from the robotics, uh, for the business professionals team. Um, Hopkinton School Committee, thank you for your continued support of HHS robotics and business professionals. Um, Club, so I will send this down. It's got some great pictures of the kids. They did incredibly well at their um, at their tournaments, and they've all signed and written notes. So I thought, I thought you might enjoy that. Um, and then finally, just a town meeting update and recap. Since our last meeting, we have been through three nights of town meeting, um, and it was a bit of a roller coaster ride. But I'm very pleased to say that all of the school committee articles were supported. So we're very grateful to the town for their support of our operating budget, um, as well as our capital articles, including the um, we will be able to break ground both on the bus parking lot behind this building as well as the athletic fields um, down behind the football field. And those projects will begin as soon as school is out and expect to be completed before school begins. So Susan is going to have a very busy summer. Um, but we're very grateful to the town for their support of those articles as well as our other articles, including technology, safety, um, HVAC, all of that kind of stuff. So thank you for that. Um, and then uh, just, f yeah, so I think that's all for my report. And we'll just move on to liaison reports. And I do not have any, so we'll go this way. How about, all right. So I just very quickly, CPAC had its final uh, meeting of the year. And um, among other things, did discuss adding in, which was piloted earlier uh, this month, a morning meeting for people who cannot attend the evening meeting. So going forward in the fall, there will be two CPAC meetings for parents oh, okay. to choose from in the hopes of increasing uh, parent participation. Sure. So uh, a lot of good things going forward then. And we also, uh, uh, you and I, attended the center school farewell um, planning and for people 
who do not already have that on your, their calendars, we will say farewell and uh, turn Center School over officially to the town on September 15th. John? I don't have I only had one, and Joe and Mike did a much more eloquent job of explaining what happened at the last meeting, so I, I'm good. <laughs> um, for me, it's more just to bring everyone up to speed. I think we have a couple of things on the communication side. We have to, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and I, we need to circle back a little bit with uh, Ashok on the school website updates. Um, that's something uh, we have to do. Also on the community calendar where our school updates, you know, some of the events which are open to public, which we are going to put into the calendar. Um, I caught up a little bit with Jim. That is expected to go online in the next week or so. Um, so that's something that's exciting on the communication end. The other one, um, you know, this, this had been difficult for me. I couldn't talk about this. Uh, Earlier um, last year, we had started a formal liaison with the senior center. Prior to that, Jean was certainly working with the senior center. Um, but our um, director of senior center passed away um, last month, Cindy Cheshmore, and she was very excited when we started the liaison. And of course, she said, "No more pink." Um, but, but now I'm, I think we're all past that, and we now have an interim director announced for the senior center, Amy Beck. So we would be looking to restart that connection um, and hopefully make a visit and have some conversations on that end. Um, then there were lots of minutes that I had to catch up on, I think. And so thank you, Nancy and Jean, for helping out with that. And Sue is amazing as well. Um, the last one is I think there was a request on the tech end that we need to catch up on that came from CPAC. I don't know if you want to follow up on that. Right, uh, a training request that came in where we needed to circle back with tech with Liz McGonigal. Oh, the castle training that, That's that right. we talked about? Yes, That's for right. Dr. Zaleski and I are going to the um, there's an informational breakfast on June 9th, I think. Okay, great. so yeah, thank you. So you have that. We fantastic. Do. I did, uh, you know, we needed to circle back and mm -hmm. see if that's something you're expecting me to follow up on. That's a small stuff, nothing big. So I did forget, um, related to the ESPC, because we had the ESPC update earlier, we were requested um, to include a letter in from the school committee in the time capsule that is going in tomorrow, so we got a lot of notice. Um, but I did uh, draft something for all of us to sign, so um, we can do it at the end of the meeting. Yeah, yeah so. we can all sign it. We're try we were trying to figure out how to put it on letterhead. I don't know if we can do that. I don't know if we can pull that off in time. Yeah, so, and then you can give it to Mike. Yeah, and I'll give it, I'll give it to Mike tomorrow. Okay. So. Very good. So thank yeah, thank you for doing that. So we will officially be included in the time capsule. That's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Any other liaison rules reports? Okay. So uh, without further ado, let's move. But now we're back on new business B, Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. So um, I. Uh, Request and recommend that the school committee authorize payment from the town treasurer for the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship in the amount of $500. So moved. Second. Okay. A motion by Nina, a second by John. All in favor? Yes. yes. And that is unanimous and approved. Thank you very much. Um, okay. The accept board of directors, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right. So, um, Except has their district superintendent serve on their board of directors, and I have been attending those meetings um, in Dr. McLeod's absence, but I think that I formally need to be appointed, so I am requesting and recommending that the school committee vote to appoint me to serve on the board of directors for the Accept Collaborative for the 2018-19 school year. So, so moved. I got it. it doesn't matter. <laughs> Somebody take it. What? Mina's got it. What? I'll Mina? Say it. Okay. There you go. Um, so, a motion by Mina, a second by John. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. And that is unanimous. Congratulations to you. Um, lunch prices. Are you going to lead us through this? Yep. Susan? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Great. Um, so, the memo that you have, basically the, um, the, the federal, the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act of 2010, um, one of the requirements is around what's considered a price equity. And what that is is the 
difference between um, the federal reimbursement for a free lunch and a paid lunch, um, the average prices that we charge uh, to students who have the ability to pay has to be at that price equity or above. Um, so you can see the prices that we currently have for both the elementary and secondary are way below that, that price equity that's, that's calculated for um, this school year. Um, so in order to meet those requirements, what we're looking for here is to, is to increase our price uh, lunches. Um, so for the elementary level, the, the recommendation would be to go to the 275. For the secondary level, we have two lunch prices currently, the 275 and then what's considered a premium uh, for 325. When you look at our sales, most of our sales are at that 325 level. And when you look at the menu that's online, most of the items that are online are at that 325 level. So in essence, we actually are almost really there at the secondary level. So what my suggestion is, is to just go to that 325 as, as regular lunch. At this time, I'm not recommending a premium lunch. Um, we'll have a new director in place next year. And so I think things will look different anyway. Um, but in order to get our prices in line with what, with what is required, I'm, I'm suggesting um, that increase in price. And you can see where other districts are as well. Um, and that would also include the, the price of milk. We're right up against it in terms of the cost. Um, so just that 10 cent increase would, would give us some buffer in margin. Okay. Thank you. And, and what would this mean, uh, Ms. Rathamich, in terms of um, the overall, what, what is it that we're expecting in terms of, um, the, I don't know what the right term is, revenue or the collection? Um, or the charges, what would be the difference? Um, well, obviously, with an increase in price, you'd have, an, you'd have an increase in revenue. Right, that's right. So I'm just wondering, what would that amount to? Uh, would you happen to know that? I, I did not calculate no, that. It's, I, it's this, yeah, I mean, this really is just to get us in line okay. with what the requirements are. I'm not so much looking at the revenue, but sure. we're, we're out of compliance. We, I mean, for... Uh, for those of us who haven't been on as long as Gene and I, we, we have to do this every couple of years. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Because yeah. I because the the because the, the the limits shift and the number of of meals we're selling shifts. So this is just a, a reset that we end up having to do every couple of years. Right. Okay. So we have to do it. Yes. 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 Okay. I love the motion. I sort of had the same. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to approve something we're required to do. Uh, right. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kavner, you were about to say something. When. Mrs. Rodmick and I talked about this. I sort of had the same question, and then I came to realize that kids are already paying that price, so families aren't going to really feel much of an increase. Okay, that that's what was on my mind. Right. That you know, while for some people that may not seem much at all, but when you do it cumulatively, and if you have four kids or five kids in this district, it may add up, and I wouldn't want that. Um, so that's where I was coming from, but you're telling me that we have to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, so I am looking for a motion to approve the following lunch prices for FY19. At the elementary level, $2.75. Secondary level, $3.25. Adult, $3.75. So moved. And in a second? Second. Okay. A motion by John, a second by Mina. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and then I also am looking for a motion to approve the increase to the cost of milk from 50 cents to 60 cents for FY19. So, so moved. We'll go. Second. Okay. Um, motion by Nancy, a second by John. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. So those are both unanimous. Um, and I assume you'll notify parents of the change. Okay. Um, so moving on to old business, we have our Gale contract amendment. Um, so Susan, can you walk us through what, th what this is? So part of the original bid and part of the, the cost that you've seen all along is the what's considered the construction period services. So in other words, it would be a project manager um, that would oversee that everything that goes all of the construction is in compliance with the bid 
Um, they are the engineers. They understand the the, the bid. I mean the um, you know the design documents, uh, not necessarily. Uh, Definitely the bid, but the design documents as well. So they would be overseeing that construction and making sure that we as consumers are getting what we are paying for. So, Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so I am looking for a motion to approve the adjustment to construction phase service contract between the Hopkinton Public Schools and Gale Associates. So moved. And a second. Second. A motion by Mina, a second by John. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, so that is unanimous, and you'll <coughs> let Kathy Herwell know. Yes. They have really done an outstanding job so far, I have to say, on this project. So um, I feel comfortable and confident in them leading us through to the end. Um, and so then the next piece is the athletic field subcommittee membership. So right now the school committee representation on the athletic physics. Um, field subcommittee consists of me and John, so that's not going to work very well <laughs> kind of going forward. Um, obviously, a lot the work is substantially done. However, there will be um, construction um, conversations as well as the continued efforts for community fundraising and the establishment of the oversight committee that we will be having with um, Parks and Rec. So we do need to have a school committee member on the um, on the subcommittee. So um, Nancy has volunteered to take that on. So I just uh, need a motion to approve the changes to the athletic field subcommittee as follows to remove Jane Birchman and John Graziano as two school committee members and to add Nancy Cavanaugh as one school committee member. So moved. And a second. I'll second that. Okay, so I'll motion move. by Mina, a second Conflict by bit. Jen. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, so that is unanimous. Um, and we are now at our second opportunity for public comment. Uh, I don't see any members of the public here, <laughs> so I believe that we can skip right over that. And we are now up to items by consensus. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, so as the acting superintendent, I recommend that the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So moved. And second. Okay, so motion by John, a second by Mina. All in favor? Yes. 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 So that is unanimous. Hey, you caught us up there somehow. How about that? Know, right? We really made up for time. We made up some time at the we end. We ended on time. We had a great celebration. Uh, this is a really nice way to conclude. Um, I know my service. I hope, John, that you feel the same way. So I want to say thank you, everyone, again, and um, most especially kind of saving the best for last. But thank you so much to HCAM for all, uh, I mean, we think we go to a lot of meetings. <laughs> We're only one committee, and they cover every committee in town. They never say no. Uh, they get their, we, they get our meetings up immediately for people um, to have access to them, and so just can't thank them enough for all that they do to help the, keep the community informed and engaged. So thank you very much to you and to HCAM, um, and so. And to Bob specifically. And to Bob and specifically. To Bob. <laughs> I know, I won't be seeing you anymore, but I'll know you you're behind back. the camera. Nice um, so, I am just looking for a motion to adjourn at 9.39. Do you wanna make it? It's your last motion. Okay. <sighs> I will make the motion, and I'm thinking John might like to second it. I will it. second it. Okay, all in favor? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. We're done. Voted no. Mm, no. <laughs>